So now, let's go to the last sermon topic of this series. Next week, we're going to have the panel again for Q&A. Right? So th this week is going to be the last kind of like a one-way you know, um, preaching. Right? And today, we're going to talk about sex. But exactly two years ago, I, was, I looked at my notes, February 18th, 2018. So that was actually the, the time when we actually had a sermon about sex. I don't know, I was, I was looking at the, it was like February 18th. Oh, really? Exactly two, like two, two years ago, right? And, and from there, more and more, we can see that we live in this hypersexualized culture. I don't know if you realize that. Everything around us is sexual, right? Uh, 2011 study, this is 2011, right? It's made, and back then, okay, 86% of young men and 31% of young women self-reported interacting with porn at least once a month, right? And out of that, 50% of men have weekly interactions, right? But when we actually see pop culture, we don't have to even look at pornographic website to be able to, you know, to be influenced by sexual imagery. Right? Look at this picture. Right? This is not something. Some, some probably some is like, oh, okay. Right? No, this is the picture that you see every day. Right? What does it communicate? Right? When, when we're in the, where we, you know. For, for us who are in the marketing, you know, I have a marketing background, advertising background, or, or you know, entertainment and things like that, we know that every single word, or every single picture, every single scene is intentional to deliver a message, right? And on the copywriting, on the lyrics of the song, every single word is intentional to deliver a message. The question that we need to ask is, what kind of message that the world is trying to deliver to us? Right. There's another app that is it's not in the PowerPoint. Oscar, can you show? I want. Carl's Jr. Burger. What does that have to do with burger? What? Okay. Now, what kind of message that, you know, the ad is trying to convey to us. Yeah, it's about the size of the burger, but is it really about burger? There is certain influence that, you know, the world is actually trying to shape, to, 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 you know, to, to give to us so that our culture and our view will be shaped. Right? And some of these, you know, some of these uh, cultural value that, that, that the world is trying to, we can go back to the, to the PowerPoint, right? And again, this is, you know, you probably can say, oh, you know, you show that at church? No, this is something that you see every single day. You go to the grocery store, when you actually line up and look at the cashier and you look at the magazines, right? And, you know, back then, uh, when, you know, to access pornography, you have to go to kind of like, you know, this adult vi uh, a video store, and then in the video store, there's this little room that you have to get into, there's the door that you have to get into to get to access like pornographic material. Now, we don't have, we don't even have to go anywhere. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, it's getting worse and worse, and, and and, and we need to, to pay attention of what is the world is trying to tell us. What kind of message, right? One of the message that, um, you know, that they, they try to tell us is that you need to be sexually appealing to have value. Sex appeal is your identity. Your identity depends on your sex appeal, on how good you are in attracting a mate. And many of us, you know, sometimes believe in that. Believe it. I'm not saying that you cannot dress well or, you know, like get a nice haircut and then things like that, right? And not, not like that, but what is the motivation behind it? 
And that, that's, that's a message that, that the world is really trying to tell us. You gotta be sexually appealing. You gotta have a six pack. You gotta wear a certain lipstick and all that stuff, right? And, and number two, sex is casual. Sex is just like an appetite, okay? There's no, there's no big deal. This is just about two people having fun. Right. And, and because it's appetite, it just, if, if I want it, I crave it, then I need to fulfill it. Like if I'm hungry, what do I need to do? To eat. So if I have an urge, I need to fulfill it. That's just the way it is. Right? And exposing you know, my body parts on social, as long as it's a private chat, it doesn't really matter. But you know, when you actually put yourself on, on, on the web, it's not, it's, there's no such thing as private anymore. Right? But, but again, it is casual, so it's not a big deal. It's not, it's not a big deal. Right? But then, number three people say, well, sex is essential. Sex is just a necessity. So how can sex be casual, but at the same time, it's essential? It's a no big deal, but it is a big deal. You know? That, that kind of mixed message that, you know, that, that the world is trying to tell us. Right? If you're not doing it, it's odd. I grew up like that. I was, I was in, a, in a drama course uh, you know, when, when I was in college. And everybody, even at parties, that you know, sexual um, act actually happens. I'm so glad that God actually you know, protected me from that. But back then, when I was young, I was just like, oh God, why do I have to go home? You know, that, this, that was fun. But now I realize, oh my God, thank you, Lord, for that. Right? You know, if, 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 if you try to suppress it because it's, 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 you know, it's essential, then it's unhealthy. If you try to control it, it it's unhealthy. Right? And you know, in, in some relationship, you know, there's, a, there's a message that it is essential to keep my relationship with my boyfriend or girlfriend because it is his or her needs. And in the evaluation, you know, relationship, there's a demand for sex to prove that you love one another. That's the, that's the message that we hear every day. Right? Number four, sex is purely physical. It's just like, you know, just like an exercise. Right? We, we need to experiment with each other's body. Right. Ben Stewart actually said it, he's just like, okay, we, we need to test drive it, okay, to make sure we are compatible. No, if you're a man and you're a woman, you're going to be compatible. You know that, right? It's no big deal, it's just sex, you know, it's, it's that's, that's the world, that have, that's what the message that the world actually Give us and 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 like it or not, these messages shifted our view of sex. And over the years, we have deviated from the point that you know the way that the God designed sex into something you know, and and, and we view the way God designed sex as something that is outdated, something that is irrelevant, something that is wrong. Try you know if you don't believe me, try to talk about God's design of sex into your friends, into the community that you're in. What kind of response are you going to get? People are going to look at you funny and say, like, what's wrong with you? You know, that's, that's, you know, that's the plan of the enemy, right? And this is not a new issue. Okay, if you look hundreds of years ago, let's open up 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 to 8. Okay, this is the letter that Paul wrote to the church in Thessalonica. So there's some, a body of believers in Thessalonica, and Thessalonica was under the Roman Empire. And in the Roman Empire, you know, a term like sexual purity and chastity is foreign. We talked about it last week, I think, when we talked about marriage, but you know what's happening in the Roman Empire that 
you know, a man can actually have sex anytime they want. Women has no value. Women is just an object. Uh, you know, polygamy is rampant. So having one wife is like, what's wrong with you? You only have one wife, right? That that kind of that kind of you know environment, and and the, these are the, the society that the believers, the Christian believers, back then face every single day, right? So you know, if you look at what we face every single day and what they face every single day, this is not something new. It's probably getting, it's probably getting worse because back then, you know, there's an effort needed. Now is there's no effort in terms of pornography and everything, right? But it's not a new problem, right? So, First Thessalonians, Thessalonians 1, 2, and 3, Paul talks about, you know, uh, greetings, about what he's planning to do, and introducing Timothy to the church of Thessalonians. And verse 4 is actually the first thing that he talks about, instructions, a warning. And guess what the first warning that Paul actually gave to the church in Thessalonica? Verse 3, for this is will of God that you be sanctified, you mean separated, this is from Amplified uh, Version, separated and set apart from sin, that you abstain and back away from sexual immorality. And the word sexual immorality here is actually derived from a Greek word called pornea. And pornea is where the word porn actually came in. So porn is uh, uh, you know, it's not just about images or things like that. Porn is is really an act or, or a you know a, a move towards diverting and distorting sex from the way God intended into what we want it to be. That's pornia, right? So what it's, what does he say to abstain and back away from immorality? That that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, being available for God's purpose and separated for, from things profane. Right? So we are called to, holy, to holiness. We are called to separate. Right? And, and you know the Bible keeps saying about Jesus is the groom and the church is the bride. Right? So as, as the bride, we need to be separated for the group. We need to be set apart. Right? So, that setting apart needs to be practiced by us. Even, you know, even in our, our little world. In terms of, yes, I want to be set apart. For God, I want to be set apart for the one that is going to be my husband and my wife. I need to, I want to be separated from there. Right? Next, next verse. Not to be used in lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God and are ignorant of his will. Right? So, these are the people who doesn't know God, but then there are people who, are, who knows God, but ignorant of his will. Right? And that in matters of sexual misconduct, no man shall transgress the defraud of his brother and in some translations, that's his brother and sister, because the Lord is the avenger in all these things, just as we have told you before and solemnly warned you. Next. Oh, okay, so let's go back. Yeah, that's, that's it, right? So that, that's a warning that God actually gives. This, that's actually the first warning. Why? Because God knows that humanity, we are prone to, you know, to give in to this issue. This is like a heart issue that we have to face every single day, right? But the questions, again, okay, next slide. The questions that I ask, right, is that why does God care so much about sex? And there's like a few other verses of that actually God gives warning about sexual immorality, sexual immorality. Why does God care so much about sex? If sex is casual, if sex is you know, just like an appetite. Why does God care so much? And, and, and on the other hand, why does the enemy try so hard to distort our view of sex? So there's something there, right? Does that make sense? There's something there. 
Why God cares so much, and why does the enemy try so much to distort? Right? So number one, sex, because sex is sacred. We're going to see this, okay? Genesis 1, verse 27 to 28, right? And can, we, can, we, can we read this together? One, two, three. So let's say in a modern language, how do you convey this verse? God made male and female, and God unite them and bless them, and then what God tells them to do? How do you be fruitful? Have sex. Have sex. So God made the male and the female, God unite them together, and God tells them, go have sex. It's just like, that's exactly what it means. Right? So, sex is God's idea. Right? Sex is God, I, God's idea. Right? You know, go make babies. That's what I want you to do. Once I unite you, go make babies. Right? It's part of God's grand design for humanity. Because, you know, that's how God actually invited us into this process called procreation. For example, like husband and wife, now, okay, you want to have a child, and you just say, well, let's have a child, and just stand there. Do you think the child's going to come? <laughs> right? That, you know, something needs to be done, right? And you know what the time's saying is? Because that, that God wants us to participate in this process. Right? And then last week we learned about that God is a showcase of God's love. And that marriage is a covenant agreement. Everybody say covenant. Covenant, covenant is different than a contract. Right? If you want, you can look it up at the, um, you know, even the law, like a, a law website, actually have a description of it. The difference between covenant and contract. And covenant is more binding because covenant is actually, you know, not just about, you know, signing paper and if you don't, you know, if you don't fulfill your, part of, your end part of the deal, then the contract is revoked. No. Covenant actually says that if one party does not fulfill the, you know, their part of the deal, the other party needs to make sure that they help them to fulfill their part of the dream, of the deal. And, and uh, a covenant is a perpetual agreement. It just keeps going and going. It's not, it's not like you can't cut it, right? And when I was a kid, I, I, I like to watch uh, Western movies. Some of you like to watch like Western movies? Cowboys, Indian, you know, the First Nations and blah, 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 blah. Back then they called it Cowboys Indians, now they can't call that anymore. Right? And, and when there is a, a covenant or a brotherhood agreement is made, what do they do? And this happened in Chinese, you know, martial arts movie as well, right? They kind of like slit their tongue or their hands or whatever it is, and they shake hand, and there's an exchange of blood. Covenant agreement is marked by an exchange of blood. That's why in the Old Testament, to mark uh, God's covenant agreement to Abraham, we have to sacrifice an animal. There's got to be a blood that is shed, right? And let's look at the theology of salvation. When did salvation become official, like salvation from all mankind. When? When Jesus died on the cross, he shed blood. Everybody agree? Yeah? Okay, so I guess we're on the same page now, right? So when Jesus died on the cross, right, God's love penetrated into humanity, right? Everybody agree for that so far, right? And through the shedding of the blood on the cross, then you know there's a form, there's a form of unity before be, uh, you know with with God and man, right? And that forming is marked by the veil that was torn in the temple. Everybody knows that story. This is the story. But when Jesus died on the cross, the veil torn, 
and God's love invade humanity so that now there's no barrier between man and God. Right? Now let's time travel to the time when there is no such thing as a marriage certificate. Okay, I know we have to go a long way. Okay, just go. Okay. When do you think, what do you think officiate a marriage between two persons at that time? When there's no things to, nothing to sign? The child. Hmm? The child? The child? When the child was born? That's, that's okay. So when, if, when the child is born, then we're married? If not, then we're not. When? Hmm? Before you know, we have to sign everything. Everything. If you if you watch like an old martial arts movie, you probably see see it. When you know, after the wedding, the bride and groom went into the room, and the in-laws, everybody just like watching it, just like and trying to listen outside of the, you know, because the officiation of that marriage happens when there's a sexual act between the husband and the wife. That's when he says, okay, now you are husband and wife. And uh, the other in-law says, yeah, you're husband and wife. Right? <laughs> and what happened in that sexual act? We are adults here, okay? So let's, let's talk about this. This is a little bit graphic, I know. But what happened there, right? The groom penetrated to the bride. Right? Marked by a veil that was broken. This is, you know, biology confirmed that. And, and even some biologists doesn't even know why that, you know, this thing called hymen, why, why was it there? Nobody understand that. But there was a veil that was broken and there's a shedding of the blood. And, and you know, the, 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 what happens in the man, right, for, for them to be able to do it, there's, you know, also a, 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 some, uh, you know, a process in the blood system that enables him to do it. So there's an exchange of the blood. With a veil torn. Can you see the correlations? When I was like, I said, okay. What? And that was sex was created for. To show us that. Right? And what happened after that? What happened after salvation? God tells us to make disciples. Correct? What happened after somebody gets married and has a sexual act? They will have disciples. This little... <laughs> <laughs> ah! Okay, that's your disciples. Baby Christians, you know, ch children Christians, teenagers Christians, adult Christians, and then they're off to make their own disciples. Do you see the process of that? The similarity? That's, that's, isn't that amazing? Right? And that's why you know sex is sacred, and this can only be understood by those who experience the work of the salvation. It's just like, you know, for, for you, you understand, whoa, that is true. That is true that you know that's God has created, you know, God is who creates human being, create this process to show us what does it mean, what salvation actually means. It's a showcase of that. And husband and wife relationship is a showcase of God and man relationship right after salvation. That there's no openness. Remember last week well, we talked about when Adam, you know, I mean, Eve, and they're naked and there's no shame. Right? And what does the, what does the enemy try to do to distort this? Because now it becomes casual, it becomes no big deal, then salvation is no big deal. The work that Jesus did on the cross is no big deal. Right? Number two, sex deepens relationship. And sex is not just about making babies, okay? Right? In, in, in a marriage relationship, you know, you, you don't just have sex to make babies and after that, okay, you know, we're done. No. Because there's an element of uh, a relationship deepening in, in, relation, in, in, in you know, sexual act, right? A husband and wife uh, relationship. Proverbs 5, okay? This is your Bible speaking. 
May your fountain be blessed, and may you rejoice in the wives of your youth, your loving daughter, your graceful dear. May her breast satisfy you always, and may you ever be intoxicated with her love. It's just like, woo, but that's the Bible. Okay, this is about men desiring, you know, quote unquote, a, a sexual relationship with the wife. And she's like, okay, well, that's men to, to, men to women, right? Read Song of Solomon's. Maybe next time we do a series on that. It, it goes both ways. There's a desire for both to, ask, to have sexual intimacy. Right? Because sexual intimacy, um, you know, deepens relationship. Right? Why is that? You know, an anthropologist uh, called Helen, uh, Helen Fisher, Fisher, she was uh, actually featured in, uh, you know, in, in TED Talk as well. She mentioned that when, you know, when, when a sexual act is committed, it fires dopamine and oxytocin. Right? Actually, if you want to, you know, complete things, that are, there's a dopamine, serotonin, and oxytocin, and neuro, neuro something, right? But these two are the major things, right? Dopamine and oxytocin, right? What is dopamine? Anybody a chemical savvy here? What's dopamine? It's a chemical reaction you get that uh, like, uh, deals with the reward system, right? Reward system? Yeah. Anyone else? Reward system, it's, 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 they, they call it the pleasure hormone, the, the happy hormone. Dopamine and, you know, and oxytocin. It's, it's like you know, when you're craving for bubble tea and then you go to cocoa and you, you, you sip it and it's just like... <laughs> <laughs> no, dopamine is just like... <laughs> That's dopamine. <laughs> right? That, that's just a happy hormone. It, it is a pleasure hormone, right? And, and, and with that pleasure hormone, you, you will seek it again and again, right? How many of you like bubble tea? Why are you going back to bubble tea? Because bubble tea makes you happy, right? And because the dopamine tells you when you sip bubble tea, oh, it makes me happy. So you know, a week later, when you want to be happy, it's over, bubble tea again. So that, that's dopamine. Okay, oxytocin. Right? Oxytocin is called a love hormone. Right? It gives you a sense of bonding. Oxytocin is actually released when a baby was breastfed. And that creates a bonding to the mom. Right? So when, when, when a sexual act is committed, oxytocin is also released, and that creates a sexual bond. And even anthropologist Helen Fisher, like a secular uh, scientist, they said there's no such thing as casual sex. Because when you have sex, dopamine and oxytocin is at play and you become bonded. It, it can actually give you an impression you know, that you actually love that person. And because of this, you know, um, when when sexual act is committed in the in the you know season of evaluation, it's gonna complicate things. Because now you feel that you are born with that person. And you can't have an objective evaluation of what's going on about your relationship. And this is science, prove it, right? So because of that bond, you want to you know, do it over and over again. And, and because of that, it forms what we call a soul tie. Everybody say soul tie. Right? So when, when a marriage, you know, is... is so here's what, what, what marriage was designed for, right? In the evaluation, you're kind of like, you know, uh, trying to tie your way of thinking, your mind. First, your spirit needs to be tied. You, you know, you, you got to have the same conviction. So there's a spirit tie. And there is this mind tie. Right? And there is the body ties when actually a sexual committed, you know, sexual act is committed. Right? But if you, if you fast track them, then that, so that, that basically, that whole thing is kind of like called a soul tie. But if you fast track it, you're actually creating that soul tie before you actually make a commitment 
to say that, hey, I'm going to stay in this for the rest of my life. I'm going to fight for this for, you know, till eternity. But the full soul tie is already created and it's hard. And it hurts when, you know, when things happen. But 1 Corinthians 6, 16 says this, Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in the body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. So you're basically creating a soul tie with the prostitute. Right? And, and when you practice this often enough, then you will create a default in your mind that, you know, the answer for my happiness or the way I need to solve my problem is through sex. Or, you know, the bonding actually not just not only to other human, but it can actually be to other things as well. That's where porn comes into the picture. When guys was, um, you know, research, okay, why they actually watch porn or when they end up, you know, ended up watching porn. There are three things. is when they're stressed out, when they're lonely, and when they're bored. When they're stressed out, when they're lonely, and when they're bored. What does it tell you? They tell you they need pleasure, they need happiness. Right? I'm stressed out, I need a way out, I need to be happy. I'm bored, I need to find something pleasurable to do. Uh, you know, when uh, I'm lonely, I need you know, a pleasure to company. But then the oxytocin tells you, because of the bonding that you've created, you know, because you know, we watch pornography or you know, masturbation and things like that, the oxytocin tells us that the way to get pleasure is to go back to that. That's why it's very hard for a guy to get out of this pornography. Why? Because by default, we have set ourselves yeah, every time we need pleasure, we need to go back there. And the moment you try, like, I want to get there, I want to be clean, I want to be clean, I want to be clean, and then, you know, you feel something, well, you know, the only way I can be happy and I can be fulfilled and everything is to go back there. You end up going back there, and then you feel, you know, bad about it, you cry, and you probably curse yourself and things like that, you try to go back to, go out, and then the camera came back again. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. It's because of that the dopamine and the oxytocin that actually works in you. There's a story that, maybe I shared it before, but when, when I was in Indonesia, I had a chance to work with uh, you know, some of the sweet kids, and there's a 13 years old girl that actually was taken from the street, brought to a friend of mine's rehab center, because she lives on the street. And what happened on the street was that she, is, she was the messenger from one gang on the other side of the street and then another gang on the other side of the street. If you're in Jakarta and you know a place called Pasar Senen, that's where it was. There's a bridge that connects two sides and the two sides was owned by different uh, gangs, right? And she is the messenger that delivers message. And every time she delivers message to the other side, she will be sodomized. And then that guy sends another her to, for another message to the other side, and guess what happened? The same thing. Happens all the time. So she was taken from the, you know, the street, brought into a rehab. Right? What do you think? That's good, right? Now she can actually heal. Two days. When they wake up in the morning, they found out that she was gone. So they were looking all over for her in the compound. It was a pretty large compound. They couldn't find her. And then they went back to Pasar Senan. And guess where she is? She was back there. We think that you know, she felt tortured and everything. No, because the default system, her default system, is to go back to there because that's, that feeds into her pleasure. And her happiness. It is so hard to actually bring her back to the temple. To free her. She ended up keep running away. And it's not just one time, but a couple of times she kept running away. And going back to the and we thought that, you know, why why would people do that? That was, you know, that was bad and things like that. But when the, the default system is messed up, 
with, we're going to think that that, you know, the bad thing is something that's pleasurable, something that's nice. Right? And that, that's what, what happened in, in different things, right? Uh, there's another research that, that, uh, that's actually done with, you know, the porn industry. And they said that, you know, many of the girls right now, when they come into the set, the first time they come into the set, they were actually porn ready. That's really, really sad. And that, but that's the world that we live in right now because of the distortion of that. And, and something that was actually God created for pleasure and, and, and sacred, and, and, and you know, it, it, it actually created a deep, deeper relationship between a husband and wife is, is now, you know, got messy. And after looking at this, I hope you understand that question before that, that we have before. Why does God care so much about sex? And why does the devil try so hard to distort it? Again, God never against sex. Sex is God's idea. What God hates is the distortion of it. Right? And sex is, is like, you know, it, it's something sacred, something beautiful. You know, it's like fire. You know, fire can be beautiful. It's useful. But if you're taking it out of context, it damages you. Same thing food. Food is good for your body. Right? But if you eat barbecue pork all the time and you eat like, you know, bubble tea every single day of your life, it can really damage your body. Right? Does somebody have to feel something? <laughs> Right? It's going to damage your body, right? So that's, 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 that's what, what it is. It, it's something sacred. It's something that we need to really, you know, look into and really maintain. But the devil is trying to distort it, right? So most of you are single, and now, you know, some of you are probably in an evaluation process, and now, and, and some of you will go into this evaluation process. I just want to encourage you to seriously and intentionally pursue holiness and purity, right? Ben um, Stewart says, build character, because that character will, you know, will go into the bedroom. Does the sexual satisfaction is not just when the act, but the emotional ties and everything. That will give you, you know, the, the, the maximum satisfaction of, of what it was intended to be. And then you can... Maintain the triangle. Remember the triangle that we showed you? That happens in sex too. God, husband, and wife. It's a sacred thing. It strengthened you, right? And I was I was I, I just got a chance to actually look a little bit about you know worship. When we actually worship God, the hormone that was released is actually serotonin and you know some the dopamine as well, like a happy hormone. So that's why when we worship, we feel, you know, we feel pleasure, we feel happy. When we actually connect with God, and, and there's a bonding between us and God, and God suddenly feels real. How many of you experienced that worship? That, you know, you feel like you feel relief, and, and, and there's a bonding. It's just like, God, you are so real. I can call you daddy. There's the bonding, right? And, and, and that, that's, that's what... It was designed for it. It's a bonding of God is bonding with each other. Right. So now, how do we do that? How do we maintain, you know, purity and holiness? Right. Number one, we must build a strong external boundaries. Something that I call the heart out. Okay. Build a strong wall. Not done a strong wall. Okay. Maintain self-control, right? Build accountability, friendship. So when you, on, your, on your relations with the outside, even with your significant, I mean, your boyfriend or your girlfriend, build a wall. When it comes to sexual interaction, okay? You can talk, of course, but when, when you, you know, when it comes to sexual interaction, you gotta be hard. You gotta be hard. If your partner tells you, no, why are you so hard about it? Well, that's part of the evaluation process that you need to take up. Right. You've got to be hard. 
and build an accountability or, or friendship or network to watch over you and, and be willing to receive corrections and warning. For some people, that's involved, um, you know, having a, a buddy, a really close buddy, and every time, you know, that person go up with a girlfriend and says, hey, you know, uh, can you check on me maybe about an hour or so? So that, you know, the other, about an hour, the buddy called, hey, where, you, where are you? Why am I at the mall? Okay, good, thank you, see ya. Right? Ben Stewart actually gave you know some some of the um, some of the examples that says like tell your buddy when you leave the house and when you're actually dropping her off because a lot of things happens in the car when you drop them off right so be hard on that right avoid being alone just the two of you in private. Okay. Never overestimate your power to resist temptation. And I can say that from experience. Every time I say, I, I tell myself, I'm strong enough for this, and that's the time when I fall. You are not strong enough for that. Because why? Because that's so powerful. Right? I'm, I'm strong enough to handle pornography, so five minutes? Okay, I'm just gonna give five minutes. The next thing you know, an hour later, you're still there. Why? Because of the dopamine and oxytocin and everything like that. The, you know, the moment you said, this is just a one time, I'm gonna walk out of here and not touch it again. And you, the, the next, you know, like the next week or the next day or even, you can end up going back there. Why? Because of the dopamine. It's, 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 a, it's a normal anatomy. And so don't play around with that. That's the way you, that's the way you're wired. And then you ask like, why, why God wants me, you know, wired us like that? That's not our fault then, it's God's fault. No, because God wants you to have a really great, you know, relationship with your husband and wife. So that, you know, your relationship can be a showcase of God's love. That's why God has given you the, you know, that, that system. But we are responsible to guard that system. So be hard on the outside, harder. And the next thing that you know, that you need to do is to know that you are deeply loved. Be soft to the inside. Be soft to, to, to kind of like to your heart and says, you know what, God loves me. And because God loves me, you know, God is with me in this. And if I fall, there's God that here with me. And God even, even with me when I do it. Because God's presence, the moment, the moment you receive Christ and God lives in you, where do you think God is? Everywhere you go. Even when you click pornography, God is there. Right? Be soft internally. Know that you are redeemed and you're forgiven. Because if you live in condemnation, then you start looking into pleasure and bonding, you have to keep going back there. The moment you need to, you know, you can actually be stay, you can stay away from that when you actually experience pleasure and bonding with God. Because that hole needs to be filled. That's a real thing. There's a hole in each of us that needs to be filled. You know, the, the whole pleasure and bonding. And, you know, when we're single, we need to get that from God. And that's why practicing it, even when you say, when you say, you know, uh, Daddy, I'm not going to have any girlfriends maybe, you know, in 10 years or so. Practice it now to get that hole fulfilled by God. And when we get this backward, it will create more damage. Okay? Backwards meaning you, you're soft out. You don't do any barriers. And you're just like, yeah, you know, it's okay. Once in a while, it's okay. But then you, you become hard on yourself. Every time, you know, when you did something wrong, you start condemning yourself. It's just like, oh, I'm irredeemable. I'm so bad. This is, this is me. I'm an addicted. I'm an addict. And things like that. You just become hard on yourself. And then you, slowly, you're going to start walking away from God. So don't get it backwards. Okay? Everybody say, hard out, soft in. Hard out, soft in. All right, so that's it. You know, be hard on the external, but then when it comes to you and your relationship with God, and, and, and kind of like you know, looking at yourself, 
this is not being, you know, meaning that you can't be hard on yourself in terms of, uh, you know, like getting a standard. No, this is about, you know, knowing your identity. Where is your, your identity is? Right. So sex is God as I, God's idea, and He has the best plan for it. And what He hates is not sex, because if He does, then gen, there, there won't be any Genesis one. The moment God created man and woman, the moment God put them together, remember what God says? Go have sex. So that's, that's literally his idea. But then when, when, you know, when the enemy distorted, then it becomes damaging. And it's damaging us. Not only us, it's damaging the relationship between us and you know, husband and wife. It damaged the children. It damaged the children's children, because the example that you see is not really, you know, according to God's plan, right? And it damages society, because, you know, if you have a, a wrong worldview, you get into business, you get into entertainment, you get into things, and that's how you're going to portray. As long as it, you know, it makes money, I don't care about values. And you know we, we deal with a lot of issues like that, you know, with human trafficking, you know, child pornography, um, pedophile, and, and everything, right? And we try to actually handle the the symptom of it, but if we don't go back to the value and fix the value, those symptoms are going to keep going, and it's going to get even worse. Right? So the real answer, if you want to, you know, if if we care so much about human trafficking and things like that, the, the, the real fight is actually to get on our knees and pray, right? Fight it in the spiritual realm and start, you know, making disciples so that, the, you know, people around us will have a change of value. Because when there's no demand, there's no supply. When there's demand, there's always I don't know where you're at, you're at right now, okay? Maybe some of you made a mistake in the past. You look at your life and say, yeah, you know what? I, I, I messed things up in the past. Or, you know, I, I did something wrong. But I want you to know this, okay? God loves you and God's redemption is here for you. And His forgiveness is for you. And it's never too late to repent and to go back. So I invite the worship to come forward. I know a couple, Tanita and I know, know them. They, before they know Christ, they had like a really, you know, sexual relationship. And they, you know, they even lived together. But when they know about this truth, they said, we want to repent. So they make a decision of maintaining holiness and purity from that day on. And what happened after that, you know, when they get married, there's kind of like, you know, a revival happen, you know, with someone in France. They experience Christ's love there. And now their life is so blessed. They have a like beautiful marriage. They even mentor couples right now. Why? Because they make a decision to say, yes, we did a lot of bad things in the past. But this is it. This is the time for me to go to God's original design and start walking towards it. Was it easy? It wasn't. And they start having an accountability partner. They talk to the pastor and say, hey, can you can we watch over us? So God restored everything. And I believe God is going to do that to each one of you. It doesn't matter how bad your past is, or even your present, but there's God's promise for the future. 
restoration, redemption, transformation.